so today I'm going to talk about uh, an overview of uh, functional safety. So I guess many of you uh, might not have heard about functional safety. Of course, you, have, you must have heard about safety, but uh, functional safety is, uh, is, is, a, is a branch of safety and it's a very important field, uh, especially for engineers who are developing safety systems. So let's maybe uh, look into this domain um, and uh, some of the interesting things uh, that we do at NXP. So in the uh, so yeah, I think uh, a brief introduction about myself. So I started working at NXP slash Freescale back in 2004. Uh, I started as a VLSI design engineer working on uh, the different uh, course and platforms, IP design, uh, mostly front end design. And then a few years back, I decided to move into systems engineering. And uh, for that perspective, I think functional safety was one of the areas where my interests were. And so I moved into functional safety a few years back. And since then, um, this has been the branch where I have gained expertise. And uh, now I'm leading the team here in Noida. Uh, so let's maybe uh, jump into uh, the agenda for today. So what we have is uh, for you is uh, uh, I'll briefly explain what's the need for functional safety. So we'll look at uh, uh, one or two examples as to how uh, the lack of safety impacted lives of people and uh, how how uh, how functional safety can actually uh, save our lives. And so why is it important for engineers to know about functional safety? Uh, we'll talk about very basic concepts of functional safety. We'll not go too deep into the uh, the different things that are there, to not too deep into the terminologies, but at least a high level overview of what functional safety is, uh, its basic concepts. Uh, we'll then jump into uh, so the three applications that uh, I prepared for you. So these are all three are automotive applications. One is the electronic power steering, um, the traction inverter, the battery management system. So all three are um, safety related applications. So if any of these three fails, then your automotive or your car uh, will not work correctly. And so this, these, all, all these three uh, applications, uh, let's maybe look at uh, how uh, an, a safety engineer would uh, look at these systems, think about uh, what is additional, additionally that needs to be done to prevent a malfunction and um, what, what's the procedure that we go about doing this. Then I will talk about uh, what we do at safe, uh, at NXP for functional safety. Uh, I'll walk you through some of the process processes that we have, uh, and that's an important part of functional safety that uh, you are following the right procedures. You are following the right. Uh, uh, you're, you're taking the right call whenever you're developing a system. So that's that's really important. So it's important for you to know what we do at NXP. And um, this is something that uh, you will see at every every organization uh, who is dealing in safety systems. And finally, I'll conclude with a few remarks as to what you can do uh, to enhance your learning, to, um, uh, to learn more about this area. OK. So let's uh, get started with uh, the need for functional safety. Now, I think safety is a term that uh, everyone has heard or everyone is aware. So you read in newspapers some of the other accidents uh, that happen and uh, you often wonder why those accidents happen. Uh, so some of those accidents uh, I've listed here, uh, it could be a deep water explosion uh, in a, a failure of a, a, a failure of an airline. Uh, it could be a, a um, accident in an industry, in a factory where you are working. It could be a windmill accident. There are so many. I mean, so we keep on hearing these uh, accidents. For example, the uh, the electrical uh, scooter just caught fire. So we keep on hearing these incidents, and uh, you wonder as to what's the root cause. So the first thing that comes to your mind is why did this did did, did, did this happen? Did it happen because of something that the um, that the car that the operator did not do was it a driver malfunction? Did the driver did not drive correctly, or was it the manufacturer's fault that caused this accident? And so the, all these questions start to come into your mind. Now, what functional safety does is it tries to look at these different uh, failures, or uh, and and tries to argue or tries to create. Uh, uh, so the objective of the functional safety is to create systems which uh, uh, where where if such failures happen then the uh, the casualties that happen they reduce so that's the, that's the objective of functional safety okay let's now look at one of the accidents that happened uh, several years ago about 40 years or 30 years ago 
uh, which uh, was a safety incident. So I'm sure you must be aware of uh, the Bhopal gas tragedy incident, uh, which left uh, many people dead and many people even suffer till this date um, after, uh, due to, uh, um, of, of the aftermath of this uh, of this accident. And what happened on on this uh, um, in this tragedy is that uh, on second of December 1984, the operators uh, in a, in a factory, uh, so it's a union union carbide factory which is uh, having uh, which manufactures pesticides and it has several chemicals uh, um, in in the factory. Uh, so they began. Uh, uh, maintaining or create um, or starting the operation of uh, washing pipes uh, to clean the filter system. Uh, now the water reached the tank which contained uh, methyl isocyanate and started to react uh, with the with the with the chemi chemical and it generated toxic gases. And these are the toxic gases that uh, let that were let out and basically that that's the cause that that's the cause of the accident. Now. When uh, when you look at uh, what happened, so it's difficult to figure out exactly what happened because you cannot really go back in time to figure out what happened. But then, uh, when an investigations were done, uh, this is what was found out: that whenever, for example, you are doing cleaning of water pipes, then you have to insert, for example, a a, a slip bind. So a slip bind is nothing but a barrier that you insert uh, at the end of the pipe so that uh, any water that you're using to clean does not flow beyond that barrier. Now this slip bind was not installed maybe because the workers were asked to do things quickly. So this could be one reason. So this is one of the safety mechanisms we had or safety processes that we have that whenever you're cleaning the vent, then you have to install a slip bind or a barrier to prevent the water from going into the tank or into the pipes. Uh, there were pressure gauges, uh, gauges uh, installed in the system, but uh, the operators were probably not trained enough to uh, to understand those pressure readings, and so the readings were ignored. Uh, the temperature measurement systems were not installed, maybe due to the cost reasons and so on. Uh, and basically, the there were leaky walls in the in the system, so that caused uh, the water to actually slip into the in, into the uh, into the in, in, into the gas tank. There was no cooling system, so the cooling system had been switched off. Uh, they, it led to basically a thermal runaway reaction. There was no wind gas scrubber. There was no water curtain. So there were there were multiple levels of safety mechanisms that were there. So either they were not working, or basically someone had turned them off, or basically they just didn't uh, uh, um, care about what the what the safety system was showing. And this was a combination of uh, both where. The safety mechanisms were uh, not working uh, or the operators were not trained or the process was not followed, which led to this accident. If any of these measures uh, would have been followed, then uh, the incident could have been prevented. Now this became an incident and then you actually go back and, and figure out what happened. But uh, as an engineer, when you are developing a safety system, you have to think in future ahead as to what could go wrong and then take measures right at this time to design a system that is failure tolerant or basically fault tolerant or it could it could even if it fails, for example, it will not cause a malfunction or at least it reduces the risk of causing an injury to a person. So that's the intent of uh, functional safety. In automotive, uh, there is a lot of drive in the past few years uh, to reduce uh, traffic in incidents. Um, a lot of people getting killed in uh, in in, in in accidents on on road and uh, what 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 the root cause if you start to look at uh, some of the root causes is uh, it is because of either the drivers are distracted or the drivers are kind of inexperienced or they are tired uh, maybe the weather conditions are not good maybe the roads are not good yeah uh, is there Okay, maybe the roads are not good, and so those are some of the reasons why uh, some of these road traffic accidents happen. Uh, so one of the goals is that how can you prevent uh, such accidents? Can you develop some safety systems? For example, can they monitor the driver that uh, if the driver is kind of sleeping or going to sleep, or if he's tired, then the car automatically switches off. Or basically, if the weather, weather conditions are not good, then can there be additional safety systems like say radar or say some other systems that can actually help the driver to drive better or maybe it gives a warning maybe to kind of uh, go and uh, wait for uh, better conditions. So those kinds of things are there. Uh, 
Uh, apart from that, the other drive that's there in automotive uh, uh, industry is that as uh, the electrical vehicle revolution is coming, more and more electronics is uh, getting into the car. Uh, and uh, what uh, uh, a fallback or basically a, um, a not so good thing about uh, having a lot of electrical systems or electronic systems in the car is that there is a potential that uh, the electronic systems might fail and they might cause uh, accidents. So that's another area. For example, here we see that there was uh, there was almost 20 million passive safety systems that were recalled. Uh, for potential malfunction. So as the electronics increases, then there's a potential that they can malfunction and cause an accident. So that's another area uh, which we need to be concerned that uh, uh, from a safety perspective, are we putting the right electronics in the car? So all these different aspects, uh, the drive for having safe systems as well as whether those systems work correctly or not. So this is something that's driving the automotive uh, functional safety domain. So uh, in automotive, uh, if you look at uh, uh, what this slide shows is uh, the different uh, systems. So some of the systems in the car and uh, what's the safety integrity level. So we'll come to the safety integrity levels. Uh, so on automotive, uh, we have the safety integrity levels ranging from a low safety integrity to high safety integrity. So there are some systems where you want to have uh, very stringent safety. For example, if you are driving and your brakes fail, then you are definitely going into an accident. So braking system could be a SLD system. The, your airbags should get deployed. They should not get accidentally deployed. So this could be a, a low, a medium safety integrity. Uh, they could be a lower safety integrity, such as things like say driver assist. So th this could be uh, a lower safety integrity levels. And so in automotive, uh, as we'll come down in later, that uh, there are different safety standards and the different safety standards uh, define uh, different safety integrity levels. So here, what you see here is, for example, we have a safety system like uh, vision. So vision is something where you are uh, through a camera, you are observing what's happening around the car and taking decisions, either taking decisions yourself or um, providing information to the, to the driver that something is coming up slow down or um, or basically take a turn take a turn or things like that now depending upon how much assistance or how much autonomous that system is the safety integrity could be low to high so if if you are basically just leaving everything to the car then you need to have very high safety integrity if it's only performing an assist function then you can live with a lower safety integrity because even if say that system fails the driver is still in charge of the car so that's how you kind of uh, i mean so if you look at the entire uh, different systems we have in the car, the, the safety integrity of each of these systems is uh, figured out and I'll show you a few examples as well as what's the procedure to figure out those uh, um, safety integrity levels and uh, based on this you design the system uh, to meet those safety integrity levels. Okay, so that's the, the, the high level as to why uh, we need functional safety and uh, how it impacts some of the uh, electrical systems uh, or electronic systems that we develop for different industries. Uh, let's now look at uh, the basic concepts of functional safety, what it is, what's the formal definition of functional safety. So functional safety is uh, the absence of unreasonable risk uh, due to hazards caused by malfunctioning behavior of electrical and electronic systems. So I think all of us understand that what could be a malfunction of electrical and electronic systems. So if you're designing uh, something, uh, some motor, motor drive to turn the motor with uh, X speed, but actually it turns with uh, faster speed or it doesn't turn. So that's a malfunction. I mean, you intended to do something, but it is not uh, doing it like that and the, like the way you intended it to. So that's the malfunctioning of the system. The hazard. Uh, so if a electrical system malfunctions, then it would cause uh, uh, it could cause an accident or it could not cause an accident. So that's how you define hazard. So hazard is uh, something basically. Uh, so I'll come to the definition of hazard in, in next few slides, but hazard is something basically which uh, causes a causes a uh, which is a, which is an impact or which uh, which is an effect of the malfunctioning behavior of the system. The risk. So risk is what's the probability that uh, um, that uh, that the malfunctioning behavior can cause a certain hazard so that's the risk um, it, i mean it could, it could be a low risk i mean there's a lower risk uh, for that to happen because maybe you have designed the safety system really 
very very stringently it's like very li less likely to fail uh, and so the risk may be low or the risk might be high and so there's different uh, there are different concepts there so um, some people uh, so the the definition of risk itself is kind of uh, uh, vague for a layman for example some people uh, would put their all their money in savings account they don't want to risk anything and so some people would put their money in the stock market. So the definition of risk itself is different for every person. Uh, what the safety uh, standards, so I'll come to the safety standards part. So what the safety standards help us to figure out is what's the right risk level. So it makes it independent of each person. From an engineering perspective, that makes it easier for us to quantify the risk uh, what that is associated and to make better judgment on how to design a system. So that's that's the risk part. Uh, a note on functional safety. Uh, so right now, functional safety is not required from legal, but uh, whenever say an incident happens, um, and say the incident goes into court or or in any other, uh, there is a investigation done. Then what is evaluated is whether the person who developed that system actually followed the state of the art or not. And functional safety is the state of the art. So that that's something that needs to be uh, considered uh, whenever you're de developing a safety system that uh, you have to demonstrate that you are um, that you did not ignore the practices of functional safety um, and you uh, you were aware you followed the practice. So that's something that you need to demonstrate whenever there is a claim of liability on a product on a safety system. So I talked about safety standards. Uh, so I think uh, safety standards or in general standards, there are many, many standards. Uh, so uh, standards is something that probably uh, is there's a little, um, little, little. Uh, there are very few courses in universities that talk about uh, standards and le even less on the safety standards. Uh, so this is one of the things that. Uh, for industry, it is uh, it is kind of really important for us to have standards and a standardized way uh, across industry to think alike, to be able to develop uh, the systems and have a common terminology so as to be able to even interact with other companies and other people across the industry. So standards are really important um, and knowledge of having these standards, participation in these standards is one of the key areas where uh, where we see, I mean, um, uh, differentiation between industry and academia. So on the standards, uh, so IEC 61508 is uh, the generic functional safety standard. So this is the the kind of a central standard out of which multiple other standards spawned out. Uh, so one of these standards I talked about automotive. So this is the ISO 26262 automotive safety standard. Each of these standards uh, talks about how to estimate risk for their particular application. So we have different standards for different applications. We have, I think I talked about automotive. There is standard for aerospace. aerospace. We have standards for medical. We have standards for uh, industrial and so on. So each of these standards, depending upon the application that they are targeting, they define uh, uh, how to estimate a risk and uh, how, do you, how do you quantify the risk. Uh, for automotive, uh, the, the risk level that's, uh, Quantified is called as ASL or Automotive Safety Integrity Level. Uh, as I said, every person would have a different way of uh, uh, dealing with risk, or uh, basically dif different uh, definition of risk, right? But the standard helps us to uh, align what the risk could be for a certain scenario for for, uh, for, a, for a certain hazard. What the standard says is that uh, to estimate the risk you have to define three different parameters. So the three different parameters are severity, exposure and controllability. So severity is what's the level of injury that would happen if that hazard happened. So would the severity be light injuries? It will be severe injuries or it could be a fatal. So those are three different categories uh, that you classify based on the hazard that you can. If the hazard happens, then this is the severity that would happen. On the exposure as to how Frequently that can happen or basically the condition and, and under which that hazard happens, is that going to happen very often or very, uh, very, uh, very unlikely to happen? For example, if you're driving on a highway and that condition can happen on a highway, then it is very likely to happen. 
while if you are say driving it uh, in a rainy season maybe it is less likely to happen so it, it it depends i mean so how you define your exposure as to what are the different environment conditions what are the different conditions in which you are driving so that defines your exposure um, how likely it is to happen and the controllability is as to how easy it is for people to control if that hazard happens so for example if you're driving a car at a low speed and your brakes fail then maybe you can do something maybe take uh, i mean slow it down and then maybe go i mean slow it down further and basically um, take it on the sideway and then um, and, and the impact would anyway be low so you have a better controllability of a car when it is driving at a low speed versus a high speed so those those kinds of things uh, um, you can analyze as part of a controllability what the standard says is once you have estimated as to uh, what's the severity what's the exposure what's the controllability you can classify the safety integrity level requirements or the requirement from the system from acl a to acl d so there are four different categories you can classify the safety systems depending upon the severity exposure and controllability so if your severity is really high and the exposure is also high and it is like very difficult to control then the safety integrity of that system should be acl d or it should be developed according to the requirements uh, of acld so the standard for each of these safety integrity levels it prescribes different requirements for developing that safety uh, safety system uh, now you have to take into account that uh, as an engineer you have to be sensitive to the cost of the system so if you you can have a system which is like really safe it can never fail or even if it fails it will go always in safe state so you have reduced the probability to almost zero but then it is so costly that it will never sell okay but at the same time you can also design a system like which is like really cheap but does not have uh, any safety in it and it will just fail as soon as it goes into the market so you have to have an uh, have a compromise between cost and safety and so what this uh, analysis enables you to define is as to what's the what's the safety requirement or what's the safety integrity level that's required for acl d systems the cost will be higher you will you will have many more requirements to fulfill but at the same time uh, you will have a better safety for those systems if you have a, if you have an acl a system then maybe the cost can be reduced because you do not have to meet so many requirements of the standard and uh, you can save on the cost but at the same time you can meet a certain safety integrity which will be good for certain applications so depending upon the the, the compromise between cost and uh, um the safety integrity level this gives a the, this gives the safety engineer flexibility uh between to choose between the different safety integrity levels uh depending upon this analysis there are some systems uh, which are marked as qm so these are quality managed systems so for these systems uh, so if you do this analysis you do not have to follow any requirements of the safety standard so this is just a quality managed uh, product or a system which uh, should just meet basic reliability requirements and so on but you don't need to um, kind of uh, develop this system as a, as a safety compliant system and follow the requirements of the standard so this is uh, this is how uh, you estimate the risk and basically estimate the requirements that you should meet uh, to comply to certain standards and uh, this is uh, Uh, this ranges from acl a to acl d i think that that's uh, one important thing that you should remember if you can uh, that there are different safety integrity levels and the safety engineer has to make a choice between um, has to optimize the cost as well as uh, make sure that the safety of the device or the system is not compromised and you should meet a certain safety requirements depending upon the safety integrity level that comes out of this analysis okay so let's maybe now look at uh, hazard so i think hazard is i think i mentioned about uh, potential source of harm that can cause a uh, malfunctioning behavior uh, for electrical and electronic systems uh, there are two classifications of uh, failures so there could be as random failure so a random failure could be something like you have a electronic system and due to maybe uh, during its lifetime maybe some component maybe some register some um capacitor some ic basically starts malfunctioning randomly okay maybe because uh, due to um, due to long usage maybe it is no longer um no longer able to give the performance that it's required to maybe the register for example it deviates 
from the from its tolerance levels and so that's that's kind of a random failure so what what, what we what, when we say random failure it uh, is something that uh, is only going to impact uh, a certain number of devices it's not going to impact all the different systems and all the different devices that are there in the market uh, it follows a certain probability distribution so that you can always say that there is a certain probability that you will have uh, x number of uh, random failures uh, out of say 1 million uh, parts that you sell in the market the system fa systematic failure is a different kind of failure so systematic failure is uh, where you have introduced a certain bug or you have not followed a certain process due to which uh, the part that goes into the market is uh, no longer reliable or it's no longer working properly so that's the systematic failure and uh, if there is a systematic failure in the process then it go it's going to impact all the different uh, uh, parts that are there in this in, in the market so systematic failure is often much more severe than the random hardware failures but in general we the standard uh, recommends to address both of them uh, for the classification of systematic so systematic is uh, only only both hardware and software uh, can get impacted by systematic failure so you are doing a software development you write some software piece of code then basically you introduce a bug you didn't envision a certain use case or a certain scenario and you did not write proper software code so that would be a systematic bug similarly hardware also it's written uh, through hardware design languages so you introduce a bug there so that's uh, that's a systematic bug uh, on the random side you can only have a random failure in the hardware you cannot have a random failure in software because random failures can i mean you can have a short or a random event only in hardware uh, software is always deterministic so uh, uh, the other aspect is what's the effect of these failures so um, the failure of say in hardware systematic failure it could be permanent it could be intermittent intermittent so intermittent could be something like the hardware malfunctions into a certain temperature range so you design the hardware to work say till minus 40 but at close to minus 40 it starts to uh, not work as expected so that's a failure of uh, uh, and, and basically it works perfectly well at the other at the temperatures but it doesn't work well at minus 40 so that's a design flaw or design bug which is which will appear intermittently and intermittent bugs appear to be random but they are not often random so if you replicate the same conditions the same same issue will repeat uh, repeat itself on the random side uh, the classification can be into three categories the intermittent the permanent and transient so permanent is uh, whenever you say reset the chip or you restart the power turn on and off the power even then the failure will stay uh, on in the hardware the transient is more like uh, due to an alpha particle some transient error some radiations uh, it flipped the flop but it did not cause uh, the change in the in the in the in the layout or in the in the in the geometry of the transistor itself or the parameters of the transistor itself it's a transient bug so if you do a power off and power on the transient bug is gone away so these are primarily caused by soft errors uh, and so we have to account for all these different uh, uh, failures so how do you account for these different failures so that's the next uh, next step i mean uh, that i'm going to talk about um, but I think I hope this uh, um, explanation about systematic and random uh, is clear that what is systematic and what is random and uh, what's the main difference between these two failures. OK, so how do we avoid systematic and random failures? So systematic failures, as I said, it is because of some bug or something that was introduced during the development process itself. So while you are developing the chip or while you are manufacturing the chip or while you are uh, sending out the chip, there was some flaw in the process uh, which caused this bug. Now, if you look at uh, some of the products that say NXP is making, um, it requires uh, multiple engineers working at different sites in different countries. And often we are working with customers who are also in different companies and, and basically different countries and so on. Uh, so there is a lot of... Uh, a uh, lot of planning that needs to be done or there there needs, needs to be very good effective communication everyone should know what their role is what their responsibility is and they should know what what they should be doing now and what's going to come next it's really important to know what uh, what uh, what tools for example we are using 
OK, so there could be a bug in the tool itself. So whether the tools themselves are good enough for us or not, we need to perform, say, verification and validation activities. There's a, they, we need to follow quality manage, management processes. So there's a quality management system here. So all these different aspects is uh, a part of the development process. Um, the way you can design, um, uh, prevent a flaw in the design or a bug in the design is to adopt certain practices. Uh, so whenever you are doing some software coding, then you need to follow certain coding guidelines uh, that this is how you should be doing coding. So this is uh, uh, you do some kind of lessons learned, for example. So if, you, if there was a bug in the previous uh, product, then you learn from it and make sure that the next product does not have the same bug. So these are some of the best practices uh, that you should follow. So that that that's how you can take care of systematic failures. There is no other way um, you can avoid systematic failures and uh, uh, companies which have a uh, long history of uh, developing safety systems, they have well established processes and every engineer should follow these processes, must follow these processes to avoid a safety issue. On the other side, we have the random failure where uh, things uh, um, are, um, are more interesting. Uh, so here we talk about uh, random failure. So what can you do to prevent or oh, detect random failure? So you can't really prevent random failures because random failures will happen. You can only reduce the probability of having random failures, but uh, random failures will happen on the field. So what can you do to reduce the random failures or detect the random failures? What we do is we put in certain safety mechanisms on the chip to detect malfunction of uh, any of the module. So for example, you could have a um, a core or a processor, then you might want to put a watchdog for monitoring whether the processor is working correctly or not. So watchdog is a kind of safety mechanism. OK, uh, as part of the safety mechanism, then you also need to make sure that uh, both the processor and the watchdog, for example, that you have put in, they don't fail simultaneously. So for example, the power supply to both the processor and the watchdog could be common or the clock to the processor and the watchdog could be common. So they, you have to figure out that these are some of the things. If they fail, then both the processor and the watchdog will be dead. And so this is what is called as dependent failure analysis or DFA. So this is another aspect. Uh, so you need to have additional safety mechanisms implemented or certain design practices implemented to ensure that such uh, cases are, are handled. Uh, in the next slide, I will show uh, an example of uh, what are the different uh, safety mechanisms we have and uh, how do we uh, um, how do we prevent uh, uh, what are different techniques we put in what are different mechanisms we put in on the chip to um, catch these random failures now you can always put more and more uh, uh, random safety mechanisms on the chip your die size will increase and the cost will increase so what's the right level of uh, um, coverage that you should get or what's the right level of mechanisms that you should put so that's where the standard comes into picture. The standard tells as to what's the coverage that you should get. So if you're putting a safety mechanism on a processor, then your processor is covered. So similarly, you need to analyze what are different modules that are covered, how much coverage, how much part of that processor is covered. And so the standard then comes up and says that uh, you for an ACLD design, for example, you need to have 99% coverage. For an ACLB system, maybe you can reduce the coverage to 90%. So 90% of your entire chip should be covered for faults. 99% faults of your chip should be covered for an ACLD chip. Uh, so these kinds of things uh, start to come into picture. Uh, to calculate these numbers or calculate or make this analysis, uh, there is uh, there are three or four different methods. So there are two different categories. One is uh, quantitative analysis and the other one is qualitative. Quantitative is more numeric based. So you, you do have some equations. You follow those equations, calculate the probability of failure and you need need to meet a certain number that's uh, defined in the standard the qualitative is more like uh, performing an analysis uh, thinking about what could be the different failures uh, and then justifying that for this particular failure i have a safety mechanism or not so those are two different uh, ways that uh, one is non numeric and at a high level you basically start to do a failure mode analysis the other one is more like uh, numeric based so that's the uh, the, those are the different categories and how you can avoid failures at a very high level. Let's now look at uh, one of the chips that NXP has. So this was uh, this was the first uh, um, 
product in the industry, the MPC 5643L product, which was certified uh, by an independent assessor for ISO 26262. So this is a very old chip. It's not a new chip. Uh, it's, uh, it was done sometime in 2012 or 2013. It, it is still very active. Uh, what this chip had is uh, uh, a PowerPC core with a crossbar. So you have the PowerPC core, we have the EDMAs, the watchdogs, and the system timer, the interrupt controller, the power management unit here, the crossbar, the interconnect through which uh, you will uh, exchange information. You have the flash memory, the SRAM memory here, and then there you have a bunch of peripherals like say ADCs and uh, uh, clock monitoring units and so on. A can, can and e timer. So all these different modules are there on this chip. Now, if I have to look at what do I need to do to ensure that uh, what I, whatever is a function of this chip, it works properly. So what's the function of uh, say the uh, say the processor, the power PC processor? The function of this power PC processor is to compute things. It, it is its job is to perform calculations. The job of the interconnect is to transfer data from one point to another. The job of the memory is to store data and provide the right data. So for safety, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the processor is working correctly. The interconnect is working, is transferring the data correctly. The memory is producing the right data. So what we do is we add some safety mechanisms to detect any random failures. So what we say is that the cores will work in lockstep. So when we say lockstep, what it means is that both the cores will be performing the same calculation on the same data. And once the calculations are performed, there will be a comparison done at the end to make sure that the uh, that the there was no miscalculation done by one of these cores. So if there is a random fault in one of these cores or one of these processors, then it will not calculate the results correctly, but the other processor will calculate it correctly because it will not have will not be impacted by the same random fault. Uh, and so you will see a mismatch and you can detect that uh, there was a random fault that happened on one of the processors. Similarly, we have the system timers, the watchdogs, interrupt modules, DMA, the crossbar switch themselves, they are in lockstep. So you have these uh, different uh, modules. So we put all of them in lockstep. And then you have the checker here. So the RC block that you see here, it checks the checks the results after uh, each of these units have performed their computation, performed their function, that uh, the results out of it is correct or not. So that, that's how you kind of uh, uh, start to make the uh, the product or the chip that we have here more more safe or basically at least uh, make it more fault tolerant, so to say. Uh, then we have uh, for memories we have ECC. So um, I mean, so there is uh, there are logarithms for ECC. So I'm sure you must have heard about ECC for communication, but there are also algorithms where you can have uh, ECC on memories. And so the flash and SRAM uh, are protected through ECC. So uh, there could be different variants of ECC. The most popular one is that uh, it, it's a single bit correction and a double bit detection algorithm. Uh, so if uh, there's a bit flip within the SRAM memory or the flash memory, uh, when the data goes out, the ECC will correct that if it's a single bit or detect it if it's two bit. And you have to basically then start to argue as to what's the probability of failure uh, if there are more than two bits. So if you have to, if you think that there's a certain probability of having more than two bits, then you have to argue with additional safety mechanisms. But we usually do have some arguments. And so ECC one bit correct and two bit detect usually works. For the ADC, for example, we have redundant ADCs. So whenever you're getting data from outside uh, into one of the ADC channels, one of the requirements that safety will have is to also feed the data to another ADC. So that's how you kind of do right kind of redundant computation uh, or redundant acquisition of data on the ADC channel. Uh, we, for the for the power supply, we have uh, low voltage and high voltage detectors. So within the power man management unit, we have the low voltage and high voltage detectors, which are spread all across the chip. So they keep on monitoring the voltage and uh, indicate to the driver or indicate to the system that something has gone wrong with the power supply of the chip. We have the clock monitoring units or the CMUs, which monitor the, whether the clock is working properly or not. And so these are some of the systems uh, that we have uh, in in the in the product itself in the chip um, uh, that enable us to detect random failures. Okay, now coming to the safety analysis part. 
so there are four main activities uh, uh, that are performed as part of safety analysis. So one is the FTA or the FME. Um, so this is the, as, as I said, this is a qualitative analysis. So on the left, you have the FMEA. What FMEA in FMEA, what we do is we identify the function. What's the function of certain IP or a chip or anything like that or a part of the system? Uh, what are the potential failure modes? So we are looking at a element here, elements function, what its failure, what's the then the potential effect of the failure, and then we start to argue as to what's the severity, occurrence, and detection. So what's the severity of this failure? What's the occurrence of this failure? What's the detection? What's the probability of detection of this? And we get a certain RPN number, which is a multiplication of the severity, occurrence, and detection, which is say 54 here. And then we try to argue as to what is the measure taken to reduce this RPN. So that, that's how this uh, FMEA works. Uh, so FMEA is more bottom up. So you look at the lower level element, its failure mode, and what's the effect. The FTA is top down, so you look at the overall system first that maybe the system, the brakes, brake failing could be one uh, failure. And then you start to dig down that if the brakes fail, then what exactly was the cause of that failure? So it's a top down kind of a approach where you go into uh, different uh, branches and try to figure out uh, where could the potential malfunction be. So these are two different analysis. Then I talked about the dependent failure analysis where you want to kind of uh, figure out if there is a potential for uh, both safety function and the safety mechanism, both of them to fail simultaneously. And so you start to argue what's the uh, what's the safety measure or safety mechanism that you will take to address uh, such kind of dependent failures where one failure is dependent on another. And then finally is the FMEDA. So FMEDA is a quantitative analysis, as I said. I mean, so it helps you to uh, find out uh, in terms of numbers, so they are it, it's a it's a it's a huge excel it uh, contains failure rates of each component and based on the failure rates uh, we calculate what's the uh, what's the uh, what's uh, so if you apply the safety mechanisms uh, there will be some certain diagnostic coverage of each safety mechanism uh, what's the percentage of those failures that are covered and then the target would be to meet certain uh, number certain numbers as prescribed by the the, the standard so these are different analysis that we do for each of our products to ensure that uh, they are meeting requirements of ISO 26262 from a random perspective. So all I've talked about in the last two slides is how do we cover for random. Uh, for systematic, I'll come uh, when we talk about what we do uh, for safety at NXP, then I'll explain more as to what we do uh, on the systematic side, how, can, how we avoid uh, systematic failures at NXP. Okay, so... Yeah, and, and, and last is the safety analysis report, which summarizes this. So I think uh, let's maybe now jump to the next uh, interesting part of this uh, training, uh, which is uh, the safety applications and systems. So I think I'll, I'll cover this. Uh, in, uh, I think we're running out of time, so we'll probably uh, cover this a little faster. Uh, we'll talk about three different systems uh, and uh, what uh, what's the procedure as to how do we go about developing the safety requirements for this system. So I mean, electronic power steering. So electronic power steering is a, so let me maybe talk about electronic power steering first and then uh, let's go into the other system. So what is electronic power steering? So electronic power steering is uh, a system which basically enables or assists the driver uh, to, to turn the car. So basically you turn the steering wheel in a, in a certain direction and uh, depending upon the speed of the vehicle, uh, how much uh, force you have applied and so on, it will turn the wheels of the car. So that's that's the main function of electronic power steering. So the way it looks as, it looks is that you have uh, the steering wheel and then you have this axle that goes into, so you have a sensor here somewhere, which basically detects uh, how much is the wheel turned. And based on, the, uh, based on that uh, input, there's a microcontroller or the ECU sitting here. Uh, there's a microcontroller inside it, which detects that the wheel has uh, the, the, the driver has turned the steering wheel, has commanded the wheels to be turned. It drives a motor here. So this is the motor that is assisting the wheels to be turned. So this uh, ECU drives this motor and it turns uh, the wheels in a certain direction. Okay. So this is an assist function. So uh, what um, all it all, all it is doing is assisting the driver to turn the wheels more comfortably. Okay. Apart from that, it's uh, the role of the ECU is also to inform other systems in the car 
uh so for example it could inform say the braking system what's your what's the what's the direction what's this what's the direction it is going so it informs different systems within the car other ecus in the car as to what it is doing what's the state of the steering column so that's another part that it's doing okay so this is a electronic power steering now you can imagine if uh, this ecu starts to malfunction then what could happen okay if your ECU starts to malfunction, then you would have something like unintended vehicle little motion. So even even though you don't want to say, uh, even if you say driving straight in a straight direction, there's a malfunction and uh, the electronic power steering will start to turn your wheel or your car on the left or the right direction. And that could be a malfunction which could be severe, right? So if you're driving in a high speed and your car, your car suddenly travel, uh, turns without your command, then it's going to cause an accident and, and a severe accident, right? So we have this safety integrity level defined as an SLD. And similarly, we have the different goals, and I'll come to that in more detail in the next slide. Uh, uh, so we have the different hazards listed here, and uh, we have the different safety integrity levels. So let me come to that in the next slide. Let me first describe the system here itself. Uh, as I said, so you have the steering wheel, then you have the steering column, and then you have a torque sensor which detects what's the direction in which the steering wheel is rotating. You have the ECU here, which is commanding a motor to turn the turn the gear of the of the of the of the of the wheels of the car. So that's the that's the system. There's also communication done with other vehicle system, uh, and uh, there's a power supply and ignition coming. So this is the system uh, that you see. Okay, we call this in terms of when you're developing um, in terms of a safety system in terms of ISO 26262 then there are a few terms like item definition. So what you see here is an item definition as to what is the system that, what's the definition of the system that you're developing. So that's that's item definition. And HARA is hazard analysis and risk assessment. So this is where you are analyzing all the different hazards that can impact this item. And you're trying to assess the risk of uh, each of these hazards, okay? So you have assessed that this, for example, this hazard is very risky. And so you assign that the system should comply to the requirements of SLD. Okay. Let's maybe look at uh, um, this, uh, this uh, the safety goal part again. So we, we identified the hazard. And from the hazard, what we say is that uh, there needs to be a safety requirement or a requirement to the system. So there, the system should meet a requirement that it should not self steer okay so it, we should avoid self steering so this becomes your the topmost requirement uh, for the safety system okay so you want to avoid self steering this is assessed as uh, requiring a higher safety integrity level so this is sld uh, so when you are when you are doing this what 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 hap so suppose uh, this condition happens so suppose the car starts to self steer and it starts to go into left or right direction then uh, what what should you do? So the safe state is what you should be doing when this hazard happens. Okay, what it says is that you should switch off the assistance and indicate to the driver that there is a uh, issue with the with the steering. So as soon as you switch off the assistance, the driver will have direct control of the of the of the of, of the steering column, and so uh, the steering assistance will no longer work. So that's the safe state. The steering, the ECU will no longer play a role in driving or indicate or showing what what's the indication, what what's the direction the car should turn. It's no longer playing a role. So that's the safe state that's defined here. So for each of these. Uh, safety goals or safety hazards or sa for each of these hazards we have a safety goal and we have a safe state that this is what it should do when such a condition happens and then we have a fault tolerant time interval or an FTTI which indicates how much time you have to go into that safe state so if you have a car or a system or an EPS system that starts to self steer or it starts to turn in the left or the right direction the assistance or the assistance should be switched off and a warning lamp should be lit up within 20 milliseconds of this malfunction. So that's the requirement. That's a top level requirement that's coming uh, to coming from a safety engineer to the developers, to the designers, that this is what you should be doing. This is this is something that you need to ensure that uh, that happens whenever such a condition happens. So that's how you start uh, to do. Yeah. 
uh, arul uh, i have a question a uh, basic question like uh, how do we decide this fttti as a 20 millisecond like uh, are there uh, any parameters or dependency on what kind of a design it is how do we decide this uh, uh, interval time fttti right so it is based on experience and basically based on the conditions in which you have analyzed this hazard so okay. for example if the vehicle is moving at a very fast speed then right. there would be certain self steering it will cause a malfunction really quickly so you that that's how you define this uh, fttti so it's based on some of it is based on experience some of it is based on testing at the oem level so people who do vehicle testing they know that this if this malfunction happens then this is the time that we should prevent it so this is how you define your fttti okay thank you yeah and okay. uh, after a uh, fault injection uh, uh, uh simulation we can also identify fttti also we can right. validate that one right right i think so there are system level models of uh, the entire eps system and uh, uh, so you do system so i mean so this entire system can be modeled for example in matlab and then you start to um, see what's the impact like how long does it take for the for the car to actually turn its wheels i mean what's the control loop here how long does it take for the malfunction to actually manifest itself as a failure and so you can actually do some simulations and uh, uh, figure out what could be the time so those are different ways you can uh, and uh, yeah yeah okay thank you thank okay. you sir yeah okay so yeah so uh, so we have defined i mean so i mean if you look at the safety analysis or like the safety the way of working in safety as per the standard we have defined item definition we have performed hara so we have identified all the different hazards we have identified the risk according um, for each of those hazards and now we have defined the high level safety requirements which is the safety goals that this is what we should avoid and uh, these are the different safe states and the fti so this is one part of the uh, the analysis that we did now we need to actually go a little deeper so this is like really high level requirement it doesn't even talk about what kind of eps system or what are the different uh, i mean so eps system there are 10 different varieties of eps system but this is like a really really high level applicable to all different eps systems now we need to go a little deeper and elaborate this requirement into a more uh, lower level requirement so the first uh, level that comes up is the functional safety requirement or the functional safety concept that we call uh, we call it so here in so, so if you see here closely i mean we are following a certain process here in elaborating requirement so we don't just jump into the schematics or we don't don't just jump into the uh, the hardware or the software and then try to think about that this is this might go wrong this might go wrong and then we start to uh, propose something we start from really top at a higher level understand what is the potential hazards and then we start to fine tune or elaborate or uh, derive requirements out of the highest level require highest, highest level safety goal okay so this is the functional safety concept so this uh, this is the place where we analyze the system from a functional perspective uh, we don't analyze still we are not into hardware or software we are still at a very very much at a functional level so here we say what's the function of the system so for example we have the torque and angle sensor it is providing uh, a certain value to the to the eps system okay now it could be that the torque and angle sensor provides an incorrect value so you need to have some kind of plausibility check done on this command okay so i mean maybe the, the driver did not command for uh, turning the wheel but then the sensor malfunction and then you have uh, uh some i mean you start to turn the wheel so you you then think that there should be some kind of uh, plausibility check a plausibility by plausibility what i mean is some kind of uh, check based on past experience okay so maybe the sensor it will not immediately switch from 0 to 100 and uh, so if it is giving a zero reading then it will not switch to 100 reading uh, within say uh, microseconds there will be a certain ramp up to that so those kind of checks you can perform uh, as part of plausibility checks now the command uh, that you receive from the sensor it will basically be driving the uh, it, so you compute the torque that's required and then you will drive the motor here uh, you will drive the pwm signals out of this uh, mcu and the and the gate drive then will basically drive the motor so that's how your motor driver works there's a feedback signal that comes in uh, that indicates the current in position and that feeds back to the motor driver so as to complete the control loop here so this is your control loop okay 
Uh, now for each of these systems, you need to have uh, some kind of safety implemented because if either of them malfunction, so for example, uh, if the drive or the control to the electrical motor, that there's a fault here, then it will drive the motor faster than you expect. OK, so there has to be some kind of monitoring done here as to what's the torque that's generated. Similarly, the feedback that you're getting from the motor to the position sensors, that could be faulty. So you need to do some kind of plausibility checks. The communication to the external systems, you might communicate incorrect information to other vehicle systems. So there should be some kind of fault reporting or some kind of uh, uh, monitoring done here. So all the green boxes that you see here are part of the safety system. So we have a safety manager that is commanding or monitoring, getting inputs from all these monitoring systems. And then you, if you, if the safety manager sees a failure, then it will basically cut off the drive to the motor. So that's the high level function that you see uh, how you can disable the uh, EPS uh, safe assist. Okay. So this is at a very high level still. I mean, we are still not into hardware and software, but uh, at least uh, we have envisioned as to what the system would look like and what are the different functions of uh, safety we might have to implement as we go lower down. OK, uh, uh, so for, so uh, more formally, we use uh, certain tools to write requirements. So these are some of the functional safety requirements that are there. Uh, let me maybe skip these, not going to do much, too many details, but maybe one one requirement which is uh, which could be looked at is one requirement that we note as part of this functional safety requirement is that the sum of the phase currents of the motor that should be equal to zero. OK, so if you add all the currents coming out of the uh, of the motor, so if you look at this diagram, then you have sensors coming in. Uh, so you have this uh, current measurement done on the three phases of the motor. And so when you measure the current here, then the sum of those currents should be zero. So that is one of the requirements that uh, is uh, is coming out of this functional safety concept. OK, now after the functional safety concept, we go a little bit deeper into the EPS system itself. And so we have this uh, system level diagram where we have the microcontroller or the processing function. Uh, uh, and then we have the power supply, the communication interface, the torque and angle and the motor position sensor. So uh, this is again a system which is driving PWM here and then motor interface. I think I already talked about this. So this is getting uh, sensor position and so on. So this is the overall picture of the um, of the function. Now, if I look at the safety part of it, so you are monitoring the phase currents, and uh, you, that is something you are monitoring, so that becomes part of the part, part of your safety. If there is a failure, uh, you, so you give the feedback to the microcontroller. The microcontroller calculates whether the current sum is equal or not. If there is a failure detected, then you switch off the control. So you cut off the motor here. So this is how your system level safety architecture is looking like. Now. Uh, you also disable the motor interface, the gate drivers to save power and so on. The processing function, so there's a watchdog that is monitoring the processing. If the watchdog detects a failure in the processing function itself, it signals it back to the power supply interface. The power supply interface can then basically cut off the uh, motor and uh, the motor interface. So basically the processing function is uh, faulty and so that is detected by the safety controller and so that's how you disable the motor. Right, so so that's how basically you start to like slowly step by step uh, identify, not miss out any corners, not miss out any 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 corner cases, and so you start to develop your technical safety concept. And for the requirement, for example, we had the requirement for three phase currents. You start to elaborate these requirements into technical safety requirements. Okay. So this is how you start to develop uh, your safety architecture and. I mean, the next phase, of course, is uh, then once you have implemented this, then you go into the hardware and software to uh, describe requirements as to that you need to have a PWM uh, module to monitor the PWM phase back. You need to have, say, ADCs to measure the current sense that's coming in. So that's your hardware requirement. Then on the software side, you will have requirements to initialize and measure these values and, and basically do something if, uh, if they indicate some errors. So that's how you start to develop your safety architecture. Uh, and uh, let's maybe now look at the next example. Uh, so th this is on a similar line. So this is another system which uh, is the uh, 
a uh, high voltage traction inverter um, and uh, and then i will talk about the battery management system so the high voltage traction inverter system is uh, converts the dc supply uh, and is it is, is used in the electrical vehicles to drive the uh, the motor of the vehicle so it's basically converting the dc supply to an ac supply to supply to the motor uh, to drive the car so that's the role of this uh, traction inverter uh, so the failure of traction inverter itself can cause uh, malfunction. So if the uh, traction inverter does not work properly, then you will have unintended self acceleration. Uh, you will you could possibly go into reverse. Uh, and so there are different such hazards and you have to, uh, I mean, like we did in the in the previous case in the EPS, you come up with the safety goals, define the AC, AC levels for each one of them. Uh, you then go into the functional safety concept, the technical safety concept. You talk about what are the different uh, uh, safety mechanisms you are going to put. So you, for for example, for the power management, you will have uh, over voltage monitoring, in um, under voltage monitoring, uh, some kind of MCU monitoring. Uh, uh, on the microcontroller itself, you have say lockstep implementation, memory errors you can detect. So these kinds of uh, uh, concepts start to come into picture. Um, so on the on the galvanic isolation, you have the high voltage, low voltage domain isolation, and so on. So each one of them, we basically assign a certain safety integrity. And uh, so this is how you start to like develop your safety system. Uh, um, next is the battery management system. So on the battery management system also, you identify the different safety goals. You want to avoid a thermal runaway. You want to avoid, say, explosion of batteries, uh, inaccurate uh, over voltage, under voltage condition, and short circuit detection. So all these uh, failure modes, you identify the uh, all these different hazards you identify at the top level, assign a certain safety integrity level, and then you go into the system level design. Uh, talk about uh, how you can, uh, how the different uh, modules that are participation in the participating in the battery management function they can be uh, prevented or basically the malfunction can be detected, and uh, you define a certain safe state like say disconnecting the battery and so on. Okay, uh, right. So let's me let me now uh, move to the next uh, part of the presentation, which is uh, safety at NXP. Um, so we talked about uh, systematic and random, and I talked a bit uh, about uh, random hardware failures as to how you detect, how you put safety mechanism. So now let's talk about uh, systematic hardware failures. Now, as I said, that uh, for an automotive system, there are multiple companies uh, who are involved in development of uh, uh, of a vehicle. So usually it's a three tier structure. So NXP is, for example, uh, a tier two company. We are providing components that go into the car. The tier one com com companies such as Continental, uh, Bosch, uh, they are developing systems such as the EPS system. And then there are OEMs who are developing or integrating all these different systems uh, together to make a vehicle. So OEM could be such, such, uh, something like Tata, Mo Tata Motors and, and, and so on. So uh, what ISO 26262 does is, or the standard does is, it provides certain requirements for the random, but it also provides certain guidelines for how you can have a strong development process to address systematic failure. If you look at the ISO 26262 standard, it comprises of 12 different parts. The first part is the vocabulary, and what this ensures is that everyone in the, in the safety development speaks the same language. So when I say risk, what does risk mean? You can actually go into the vocabulary and check. Everyone will have the same understanding. And there are there are a bunch of such terminologies that are there in the vocabulary. Then there is the part three, which is the concept phase. So here we do the item definition, hazard analysis, and risk assessment, and the functional safety concept. So this is what I explained in the previous slides when I was describing the EPS system. Now this part of the standard is the responsibility of the OEM. So OEM is responsible for defining what's the vehicle like, what's the item definition. They are responsible for performing hazard analysis. They are responsible for, for, for coming out with safety goals and the functional safety concept. So all these things is very much structured. So this part is the responsibility of OEM. Then we have the system level development where the, the tier ones taken the functional safety concept as an input from an OEM, and then they develop the technical safety concept, the technical safety architecture. They identify different functions, and then they start to do the hardware software design. So this is the fourth part of the standard, which addresses the, 
the system level development or the technical safety concept development. Then we have the hardware level and the software level, which is in a way shared between the tier one and the tier two. So for example, for the tier two, uh, NXP provides uh, semiconductor components. So the part five is applicable. We also provide some software components. So that's the part six here. So each of these parts has several requirements to meet a certain safety integrity level. And each of these parts is a responsibility of OEM tier one or tier two. And so the responsibilities are very much very clearly demarcated that this is what you need to do. Along with that, we have something like a development interface agreement. So the way the companies talk to each other is through a development interface agreement. We ensure that the sharing of responsibility is understood. We have this agreement signed. And so basically that's how we ensure that uh, who is doing what work, who is responsible for what. Now there are other parts of the standard like product operation service and decommissioning. So this is part is uh, more for OEMs. So once you have designed the part, it goes into the field. Even then you should have a process in place to maintain that part or do, do servicing of that part. And uh, how can you basically after say 15 years of lifetime, that part is no longer required. So those kinds of things are covered. Requirements for those parts are contained in this uh, Requirements for those uh, operations or uh, production and servicing are contained in this part. The management of functional safety that needs to happen all through the life cycle of the product, starting from definition till the decommissioning, as well as the safety management has to be there at all different levels. So safety management is that is the is the is the is the is the function that ensures that everyone moves together. So you need to have some level of management. So the safety management, there are requirements here. There are certain um, recommendations from the standard as to how you can make sure, how the management can make sure that everyone is mo moving together. Okay. You have the supporting processes. So these are some of the processes that different organizations will have. Uh, to improve the quality of the work that they are doing. So this is supporting the quality development. So these are additional processes. For example, you need to have a strong documentation management process defined. So um, you need to have the right set of documentation. Uh, you need to have configuration management that even if say one person leaves the company, uh, it's not that no one knows where that, uh, uh, what, what was the work that he was doing. So everything is there in a certain place. It's known where it is. Anyone can go and look at it. So that's the config that's part of the configuration management. So all these different things are covered as part of the supporting process. This is a new part that came in. Came in. So the first edition of ISO 26262 was released in 2011, and then there was an update made in 2018. And so this part was included as part for re having requirements for motorcycle. And then we have these uh, part 9, 10, and 11, which are more like guidelines on how to perform safety analysis. Uh, and part 11 was the other part that got added uh, in 2018 edition, and it contains a lot of uh, information as to how you develop, uh, how you should develop a safe uh, chip or safe semiconductor. And so we have to follow this uh, whenever we are uh, developing a semiconductor part for uh, for a for a safety system. Right. So. What uh, uh, what we do is uh, so we are supplying to multiple tier ones. So it is uh, so I, what I explained here that the OEM provides the functional safety concept to tier one. Tier one provides technical safety concept requirements to tier two. Uh, so there's something called a safety element out of context, uh, where if we if, if a tier two or a tier one is supplying to multiple OEMs or multiple sub, uh, multiple tier ones, then even though they do not have the technical safety concept, they can assume a certain technical safety concept and then build their system based on that. And then once the tier one comes into picture, they can look at their assumed uh, technical safety concept or the what, what they assumed. And based on those assumptions, they can uh, identify if uh, something is missing. So that's how, so this is something, this is really important because uh, it's not always that uh, timelines of the product development in the different companies match. So we usually follow safety element out of context development and uh, this is what the stand like the standard way of working is in most of the semiconductor companies. So at NXP, uh, so what we have is something called as automotive BCAM 7. So we have so ISO 26262 is just one standard. 
there are multiple other standards that define how the product should be developed. So there's IITF 16949, there's automotive spice, there is security standards, there are other regulations that need to be followed. What we have done is at NXP, we have defined one process that takes inputs from all these standards and we have combined into a single standard. So this single standard, which is automotive BCAM 7, and you can search on web to find more details about it. Uh, this standard defines policies, roles, responsibilities, procedures, and we assess this uh, standard with each of these standards. Uh, we assess this process that we have defined with, e with each of these standards uh, to make sure that we are complying to each of these standards. Uh, so, for example, this is a certificate that we got from an auditor that uh, the BCAM 7 process that we have is compliant to ISO 26262. Uh, coming to the quality system, so apart from safety, safety requires quality as a baseline. So we have a lot of quality management systems. I talked about the supporting processes. So we need to have QMS. We need to have uh, the different uh, design for design rules, best practices, uh, the risk ma ma management, uh, requirements management, uh, trainings, uh, trainings such as these we are doing right now. So all these are part of uh, um, a quality culture and a safety culture. Uh, to ensure that uh, we are not introducing any systematic failure. So root cause analysis, lessons learned, uh, doing chain management in a in a more uh, process oriented way. So all these systems basically enable us to uh, uh, follow a certain uh, follow a stringent development process to avoid systematic failures. OK, so. Uh, so in summary, at NXP, we have been developing safety MCU MPU for more than 20 plus years. Um, so ISO, even before say ISO standard existed, we were developing safety products. Before that, we were providing customers different deliverables. MPC 5643L is the first semiconductor part that we developed. And I think I, I showed you a picture of it and what was the safety architecture for it. Uh, the BCAM 7 process that we talked about, that's what's certified by TOF and uh, is compliant uh, to ISO 26262. Uh, and these are some of the certificates that we have. And I mean, as you can see, the number of microcontroller products or the safety products has kind of uh, increased many folds in, uh, in NXP and in industry. I mean, so with electrical, so, so right now, I mean, what they say is that this decade is for automotive. The last decade was for mobile phones. So in automotive, we are seeing a lot of growth. And uh, when we talk about automotive, then ISO 26262 and the safety standards cannot be missed. Uh, we have uh, at NXP also a safe issue program for our customers. So uh, basically it uh, provides a unified experience to our customers. Uh, we provide standard deliverables as part of this program. We have certain communities that are established. So for example, here, uh, this is one of the some of the communities that we have for our customers as, as well as for public where they can come in, ask questions. They will probably get some answers from uh, our safety experts or the applications engineer that are there who are managing these communities. We always have the ticket support. So this is the way uh, we kind of manage uh, support for functional safety. And uh, 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 lastly, we have these trainings. So we have, uh, so this is one training that I did today. There are, there are a bunch of trainings that are available. Or if you go on nxp.com, uh, if you are interested in knowing more about functional safety, attend some of these trainings, which go into more details as to uh, what each of these, uh, uh, for example, parts is like say functional safety awareness, standard development process with NXP products and so on. So uh, these are basically more oriented towards, for example, if you want to be a hardware engineer, then you can take this course. If you want to be a systems engineer, then you can take this course. So this is something that's available uh, free of cost on nxp.com. So to conclude, uh, so functional safety is a branch of engineering that deals with either controlling or detecting failures from systems that can cause injury or death to individuals. So I think you touch upon this uh, uh, aspect as to what we do and what's the intent of functional safety. Uh, various safety systems are based on industry practices uh, well defined in various safety standards. So we touched upon the different safety standards that we have. We Went a deeper in, went deeper into the ISO 26262, but of course there are so many standards uh, for each application for each industry. Uh, the automotive safety standard is the ISO 26262, and it covers the entire life cycle of automotive development. Uh, we should cover both random and systematic failures. Systematic failures usually have a bigger impact, so of course we need to have a strong development process. 
The random failures are not in control. We cannot control them. We have to have safety mechanisms in place and depending upon the requirements of the standard, we have to have sufficient number of safety mechanisms on the chip. Uh, the NXP BCAM 7 process is defines the processes, procedures, roles and responsibilities to avoid systematic failures. Uh, at the end, I would just uh, leave with this comment that uh, it's an evolving branch of engineering. So we have uh, uh, the, the the growth at NXP on in functional safety is uh, immense, and so we are seeing a lot of growth in functional safety uh, in in last few years spe specifically uh, since the automotive domain itself is growing. Uh, there are many applications that are coming in automotive ADAS, automotive electrification, and connectivity, which are driving the need for functional safety. Uh, there is limited education in academy about around it. I am pretty sure that not many of you would have heard of what functional safety is. You, you would probably have heard of processors and VLSA design and things like that. But functional safety is a is an important uh, area uh, which is evolving, which will impact all the different systems. Um, be it medical, be it uh, I mean, so you have these watches now, um, um, which which are where basically um, even there you ask you are basically looking at safety aspects whether it is informing the right information uh, providing the right health information to the doctors or not so those kinds of things are there and uh, we provide several courses and we provide several courses and education as part of uh, safety academy so please go out and check them out. Uh, so I hope this uh, information this session was useful for you. Uh, you got a feel of what functional safety is and. Uh, um, it's one of the very uh, entertaining fields for me. So please uh, do go out and reach uh, um, and look at the, some of the trainings we have. Search on Google, try to uh, find more information about it if you if you if you find it interesting. So that's all from my side. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to me so far.